Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. This is the place where we talk about that most wonderful of fictional subgenres, steampunk. Now, I've been talking about a lot of different, different topics, sci-fi, fantasy, and so on, history. But today I'm going to focus on steampunk. Yes, steampunk. And what I plan to do is alternate. I'm going to do this every other time, basically. And uh, I want to talk about various, about various steampunk authors that I think are really outstanding in their field. First of all, before I get started, I want to talk about uh, some of my own works. A short story that I, that I wrote a few years ago that I should have mentioned. <laughs> I wrote Halloween because it's very germane, but it's called Love at Stake. It's, a, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a fanciful romp about a vampire in modern society. It's available on Amazon for a in an ebook download, so check it out. I'll put the link below. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. Today I'm going to be talking about another one of these wonderful steampunk authors, one of the luminaries in the field, Sherry Priest. Now I've talked about several authors so far, and this is going to be the first female author I've talked about. Although there are a lot of notable female authors in steampunk, but she was one of the first, I think, that became famous. Uh, she was born in Tampa, Florida, and uh, she was an army brat. Her dad was in the army, so she traveled all over the place. Ended up in Seattle, Washington, and her home in Seattle was the inspiration for the first in her Clockwork Century series, which takes place in Seattle, and in an alternate history, of course. And uh, she was interested in the quirky, the quirky past of the city, and did a lot of study and, and visited a lot of places, and this book incorporates a lot of that into it, of course, with the requisite changes in the actual history. And I actually did get to see uh, Miss Priest at a at the Tucson Book Festival on a panel, and, and I found it very entertaining. One of the few writers in, in this case have actually gotten a chance to meet in person, which was pretty cool. So, the Clockwork, the Clockwork Century series has two main premises. One is that due to certain historical quirks, which could have easily happened, the Civil War uh, doesn't resolve right away. The South keeps on fighting, and it's still the war is still raging in the 1880s, which is when this story takes place, and that uh, kind of affects the way things are going because it, it sort of it sort of slows the progress of Western expansion. Although the later books deal a lot more with the conflict. Now the other the second premise is that a mining accident in Seattle. There's this guy that invents this mining machine, releases a toxic gas uh, called blight gas that basically turns people into the walking dead. <laughs> and uh, the city is walled off and this gas, some, some bright fellow figures out that it can be made into a, a highly addictive drug, uh, which also eventually turns its victims into zombies. So that's kind of the one of the exciting backdrops to this series. The first was published in October 2009 at the beginning of what I call the steampunk boom uh, called Bone Shaker and uh, published on Tor Books. Now Bone Shaker refers to the invention of Leviticus Blue uh, who creates this mining machine. He actually wants to sell it to the Russians in Alaska uh, to mine gold but it's supposed to penetrate the ice up there and while he's testing in Seattle, it, it, it pierces into some kind of weird vein in the earth and releases this horrible gas. They have to wall off the city. A lot of people turn into zombies. Surprisingly enough, there are people living in underground and sealed underground tunnels still living in the city, maybe because it's cheap. <laughs> and uh, so that provides some of the excitement for this. But anyway, the protagonist of this one uh, is... Uh, Leviticus Blue's son, his son Zeke, who is, uh, he's convinced that his father was not the villain that everybody thinks he was, that he, 
you know, he wasn't careless and this couldn't have been foreseen or whatever. But he wants to clear his father's name. And to do that, he, he goes into Seattle. It's a dangerous place. You need the gas mask to be in there, basically. And uh, once, he, once he disappears, his mother goes in after him to rescue him. And it's, and it's very exciting. You know, they have these you know, near misses with, with uh, zombies, and they, which they call rotters. And they meet a lot of the quirky people who are uh, living under the, uh, basically under the city, uh, including and there's an Indian princess uh, who, who figures later on in the book, and in uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of very tough <laughs> survivalist types down there, and. Uh, also, they also run into a uh, airship captain. You have to have airships in in uh, in uh, steampunk, so uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's it's very exciting, a lot of action. Uh, so this continues. I mean, this continues on from this start, which kind of introduces the concept of rotters and what's happening with history. And it's a trilogy, but there's a couple books that kind of fit into the kind of fit into the scheme, but they don't exactly, you know, they, they aren't absolutely necessary to the un enjoyment, but they're all good. One is a short story called Tanglefoot, but a young boy who invents an automaton uh, that kind of goes wrong, and uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story, uh, some, uh, some suspense in that, but uh, really doesn't defend, depend that highly on the rest of the world. Another one of these in-between in between stories, which was published in 2010 on Subterranean Press, it's an appropriate publisher for these books, uh, considering so much is underground in Seattle. In this one, a Confederate spy uh, named Maria Boyd is hired, actually by the Union, <laughs> she's hired by the Union to go after this uh, airship pilot, this renegade airship pilot. He's an escaped slave and uh, he he is also a pirate, an air pirate and smuggler. So everybody wants to arrest him. The North wants him for that. The South wants to actually return him to slavery in Georgia. So he's going to fight pretty hard not to be caught. And there's a confrontation between these two unique and quirky individuals. Uh, the the second one in the main series is called Dreadnought, also published in 2010 by Tor Books. And this is one where we have a uh, nurse, a Confederate nurse, or a nurse from a Confederate Army hospital, let's say, Mercy Lynch. And she gets word that her father, her father who disappeared long ago and abandoned the family, is living in Seattle and he's, and he's uh, deathly ill. But for whatever reason, most people in this society don't know what really happened to Seattle. It's kind of been suppressed. So all she knows is that the city's kind of a ruin after the mining accident. So she wants to go and and uh, visit him. You know, she's kind of going to let bygones be bygones, and uh, partly out of curiosity, I think. And she ends up because it's difficult to travel cross country. She ends up on a Union military train called the Dreadnought, and uh, it's a very fearsome, uh, very fearsome war machine. And uh, she, you know, is trying to trying to hide her identity. And she's also encounters a a Texan investigator. In this world, Texas is independent, and this investigator is investigating an incident involving some Mexican troops who went berserk and attacked some Texas communities, which seems to have a, a, an, uh, a relationship to this Blake gas stuff. And so it all kind of ties in. Some very interesting conspiracy here and some very exciting action at the climax. The final one I'm going to talk about, but this is by no means all of, all of uh, Sherry Priest's books, and she's written some that weren't steampunk, and she's written others that were steampunk in a different series. This one's called Ganymede. This one takes place well, partly in Seattle and largely in New Orleans, uh, which is occupied by the Republic of Texas. And so they've got kind of a, it's kind of a renegade 
Wallace Place. There's a lot of escaped slaves there, and uh, one of the his one of the heroes here is uh, uh, Josephine Early, and she's a mixed race madam of a brothel in uh, in the uh, Crescent City, and the other the other protagonist is her former lover, um, Adnan Cly, who's been sent down. Um, who she's requested to come help her with a, with a special project, and he also wants to get some stuff, um, some important supplies for Seattle. But anyway, so he's coming down to try and help her. And what it is, this Confederate warship that has sank in the swamp, and it's got this amazing new technology that the Union is trying to capture. And you know, being Josephine is part black, and she and her brother is, her half brother, is kind of wanted by the Confederates. He's, you know, he's he's obviously black. He can't pass, and so they're trying to fight the Confederates who would like to take them into slavery. And so there, there's a lot of different forces at play here, and it's very very interesting, and again a good action climax. The thing I like about this series in particular, and Priest writing in general, well, I like the American setting, for example. It's, it's a good change from everything being set in England and uh, Europe, for example. It's quite original. The idea of mixing the zombie idea with, uh, with steampunk is pretty cool, uh, especially because she gives it kind of a scientific rationale. Uh, it's, there's no voodoo involved, although some of the people in New Orleans kind of think so. I like how she gives realistically and sympathetically the viewpoints of the different characters, whether they're uh, Union, Confederate, Texan, and uh, whether they're white or black. She doesn't demonize any particular group. Uh, it's understandable, you know, the Confederates feel they're fighting for their freedom and so on, and so it's it's not like biased like something would probably be do probably be if it was if it was written even ten years later right now and that's I mean and I think she did a lot of her homework to present a realistic scenario here about some of for example some of the prison camps and so on that were uh, in operation during the Civil War and the horrific conditions that were in effect there and there's some Pretty great action sequences. They're tough to write. I know. I mean, I've written them, and they are not easy. They're not easy to get to get to, to get them to make sense and to keep up the tension and so on. I can't find many, very many flaws in this. I kind of I kind of had to think pretty hard about that. Uh, I suppose I suppose the pacing can be a little slow here and there because uh, we have to kind of build up these characters, and there's a fair number of them, especially in Ganymede. Certainly not as intricate as the works of Blaylock, for example, but that's not a bad thing, really. Uh, for the average person, the average reader, probably doesn't want something quite that complicated. Uh, so, as far as slight plot hole seems, besides the, you know, because besides the unrealistic idea of this, that this gas can do this, you know, the zombification process, which will suspend our disbelief, though. The other plot hole is that it seems weird that the powers that be take so long to figure this out. It's been going on for quite a few years, and then this, suddenly there's this drug problem, and there's this weird epidemic among the soldiers, and, and it, it, you know, the, the military forces, the, the commanders, they just don't have a clue. So, I guess that's a bit of a plot hole, but it uh, it... It makes the story a little bit better. I mean, it makes it a little bit more, a more interesting, gripping. So to sum up, this has been my review of uh, Sherry Priest's Clockwork Century series, a steampunk series, three main novels, a kind of a sideline novel, and a short story in, in, included. I would probably rate most of them with five gears. A short story, Tanglefoot, I would probably get four gears because it doesn't have a lot to do with the rest of the series, but it still was good. Let me know 
what you think in the comments below. Please like and subscribe so we can get a few more viewers and, and get Steampunk back in the back in the spotlight. Bring back Steampunk Fiction. That's one of my goals. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.